the first reading this Sunday is taken from what we would call the book of Numbers, Numeri. But in Hebrew we have, as in the first words of a document coming from the Vatican, the title given to the whole document from the very opening sentence. So too we have in the Judaic context the name of the book being that of the first words. And so for Numeri we have the first meaningful words which are B Mizbar in the wilderness Sinai of Sinai. The words that preceded just explain what's going to go on there. The Lord spoke to Moses in the wilderness. The context then of the first book is that of the desert. We have that isolation of the people of God for 40 years, which is a kairos, a moment, an opportunity for the Lord to have access to them and to work upon them and to educate them himself once they are out of a pagan context. They are prepared in the desert. But the desert is the desert and there is no consolation. They become completely dependent on divine providence and feel the pinch when things become somewhat monotonous. And anything which happens is important. The problem is that people have need of someone to sort out their problems. Moses was carrying the whole people himself and he needed help. The Lord himself came into the breach and gave him help in the form of collaborators, delegates, people who had a share in his spirit. Something which is of note because it is the model given for all time. Much lack of balance in the ministerial priesthood comes from the fact that things which are not directly sacerdotal are being handled also when they could be delegated. The priest does not have to do everything. He needs to be a priest in the short time that he is useful here on earth as an active priest. In our day and age, it is imbalanced if he is doing too many things, a portion of which could be delegated. People are actually professionally competent in their own sphere and harnessing the sleeping giant of the laity correctly is a great secret and one that liberates the priest for that for which he is consecrated. A priest, and only a priest, can do certain things. And there is also a lack of balance and order when lay people are doing the priestly things and priests doing the lay people's things. The priest is not some kind of managing director of a great enterprise. His place is not, in the first instance, behind a desk, but behind a soul, listening to a person, unzipping that person's soul, ministering to that person on a deep level, and applying the grace that he has and of which he is a channel for that which is his specific ministry in his time on earth. If there is order, the Lord then is free himself to bless. Seek ye first the kingdom of God, and all these things one thinks of bank accounts, will be taken care of by addition. Let us then remember that, because when we become so much efficiency-based that all is orientated towards success on the material level and gauged thereby, then we have got it wrong. Moses then was the leader spiritually and he was happy to be with the Lord in isolation on Mount Sinai. 
it is there that the word of the Lord was heard, and the priest needs his Mount Sinai so that he actually is coming down from the encounter and then transmitting what he has received from on high, not from below. Too much repetition of what the people already know and hear, e.g. from the media, is not what the people of God need at the pulpit. The hungry sheep look up and are not fed. With regard to the Gospel, we have the reference to Gehenna. It comes through as hell in our translation, but it is the place where the rubbish of Jerusalem was burnt, a glorified incinerator, perpetually simmering and burning and giving off odour. Well, it's rather like deep under. We know what we mean. There is, even in our geography, some suggestion of what down under must be. Any opening into the depths, the bowels of the earth, has heat and odour. And it is the odour of bad eggs. Sulphur is that horrid smell which we call brimstone. It is something which is not nice to be exposed to. And animals that draw close to openings of the earth soon die from the odour and the gaseous emissions that they take in. What would it be like to plunge into one of these craters, into the bowels of the earth, go down and down into a volcano? So these are the ways in which the underworld would be understood, even by pagans, a dark area. The Lord uses the geography Gehenna, but it is something which is meant to be taken seriously. He is also using Semitic language when it comes to saying that limbs, eyes, which are causing sin, should be removed. We call them occasions. But the Lord, being a good Semite, is saying things in a muscular way. Pluck out the eye, cut off the hand, the arm. For us, it could be press the button which makes the screen shrink and disappear on the Google box or the Goggle box. The notion of not exposing oneself to what we know to be an occasion of wasting time and worse, taking in bad things is the modern equivalent or one modern equivalent. Another is to be exposed to spending time with somebody who's going to be talking about something which is not pleasing to Almighty God and participating in his converse is colluding therewith and spending a whole evening in a place where that will be the mode is already an occasion of getting into the sin that will be going into that place, a very modern sin and we can be in it ourselves. Even actually as clergy we've got to be careful where we spend our free time. And it's not indifferent either if we as clergy are going there and not doing anything to correct bad language or what might be going on in there because they expect from us the model. And for us not to say anything is in some way indirectly to collude. We're not just free to say or not say what we like once we are consecrated and set apart as models for the sheep. For we preach with our whole being, as the great Trappist monk, who then became himself a martyr eventually, Charles de Foucault said, Ce que tu as à dire, dis-le avec toute ta vie. What you have to say, say it with all your life. So, verbo et exemplo. By word and example, we preach, we teach, we proclaim, 
and often more by what we are performing than what we are uttering. And if one is there without the other, the old proverb holds true. Your word, your actions speak so loudly that I can't hear what your words are saying. So, occasions of sin are to be dealt with. Beginnings check and consequences follow. That doctrine is to be found in the imitation of Christ and it is something that applies to each human soul. We are responsible for the consequences and there is already an element of sin in causa, in the cause, when we engage in something which we foresee to be leading to some probable inevitable consequence. With regard to the way in which the Lord is open-minded and not wanting to quench, that too is something that we can take on board. Anyone who is not against us is for us. It's the basis of much ecumenical dialogue. We engage on the spiritual level with any soul whose fundamental option is yes, yes, yes. And we can engage more with that soul than one who might be in the same dogmatic sphere as ourselves, but is not saying yes, yes, yes. There is more spiritual communion with a soul in love with Jesus Christ of an incomplete dogmatic background than with one of our own where life has been allowed to drop off to sleep. We can't engage deeply soul to soul with a heart which is not engaged soul to soul with Jesus. The basis too of Christian marriage it can't happen well when two souls do not love the same saviour. The result is always halting, it's always limping, it's not complete. There is contact on the outside, but the Lord can't be in the midst in the same way and the soul cannot share the most precious part of itself, his love for Jesus. With regard then to this, it is something that we can take away with us. The attitude of open-mindedness, which is that of the Lord himself. For the Lord, the Lord our God, is generosity itself. He's on side, he's wanting the good of. He's zooming in to all the chinks and crannies where he might get an entrance. And the minimal yes of the will, the Incoative, the incipient yes of the will, is already the starting point, already his work, for the first movement of grace already comes from him, from his prevenient movement. He is working already, and we need to work with him, seeing where he is at in any soul that comes to us, trying to work with the Lord and not against him. One does not quench the smouldering flax. One does not say, no, 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 and discourage a soul. One tries to pull out the tiny spark that's there and make it live. It's the basis of good, merciful, pastoral ministry, often based on what the Greeks refer to as the notion of clemency, epikeia. It's trying to have the Lord's compassionate heart, not that rigidity which obfuscates anything which is there and pushes away and extinguishes in the last resort. Much harm is done by an over-negative attitude. Having said that, it is not correct compassion not to give the teaching. One can have a progressive teaching and formation starting with where they're at. One always tries to be positive rather than negative, to be with the soul and not against it to in some way push away a soul which minimally wants a yes is to collude with the enemy of the soul. It might be the last chance that, that soul has had. And that soul has been sent to us by divine providence and wisdom. It's important that we have the right word and above all the right impression given, whatever the word is, 
because a soul feels straight away when that soul is wanted or not wanted, when he's a nuisance or when he's actually been sent and perceived to be sent by God and deserving the respect which God himself deserves. For in the last resort, the Lord has no lips but ours.